Uh, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Brandon Pretty. I'm the IT reference librarian for Peters Township Public Library. I do have a favor to ask uh, tonight if you could please keep your camera and microphone off during the talk. If you have any questions for our speaker, put them in chat. I am monitoring chat um, and we'll have time to answer questions at the end. Um, I also want to take the opportunity to invite you to our novel November event um, with author Andy Weir next Thursday, November 3rd. Um, Weir is the New York Times bestselling author of The Martian, Artemis, and Project Hail Mary. Um, we still have general admission tickets, um, and if you are unable to attend in person, you can also purchase a digital ticket for the recording that will be available the following day. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening. Mike Kennessy is the Manager of Learning and Programs at the Moonshot Museum. He spent more than 20 years crafting innovative programs at Carnegie Science Center. Most recently, he served as Buell Planetarium and Digital Media Manager, where he directed development of live theatric planetarium shows in partnership with NASA and the Institute of Museum and Library Services. He holds a BA in history from Duquesne University and is a lifelong Pittsburgher. Uh, thanks again for joining us tonight, Mike, and for doing this program for us. I'm really glad you're here. Thank you, Brandon, um, and uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to be here and talk to you a little bit about uh, our future on the moon uh, in both science fiction and the emerging science reality that's uh, taking shape. Um, so thanks for joining us uh, as we go on our uh, journey to the moon today. All right. Um, so I am from, as Brandon said, the Moonshot Museum. We are brand new in the neighborhood. Uh, we just launched uh, last week. Um, we are on the north side, uh, tucked um, between the McDonald's and Wendy's on um, Allegheny Avenue, just a few a few moments away from Carnegie Science Center. Uh, and it's there where the future is really under construction in Pittsburgh. Uh, we have the unique opportunity to uh, share a campus with Astrobotic a space tech company uh, that's been around for about 15 years, um, spun out of graduates of Carnegie Mellon University, um, moved to the north side several years ago and expanded rapidly uh, with the number of contracts to help bring about this new era of commercial space innovation. And a trip to the Moonshot Museum uh, involves uh, imagining yourself uh, in the future uh, on the moon and what types of careers might be available uh, we really hope that everyone can find their place in space uh, and know there's a place waiting for them uh, right here in the Western Pennsylvania region, uh, whether uh, your interest is uh, welding or making or gardening or science and engineering uh, or writing and policy and law and marketing. Uh, the space industry is growing um, in Pennsylvania and uh, uh, we are dedicated to community and career readiness for the region. Uh, any trip to the museum uh, involves uh, journeying to the moon, uh, taking a voyage to the future uh, in a lunar habitat, uh, as well as seeing real spacecraft under construction. Uh, so we're fortunate at the Moonshot Museum to have this real-time window into the work of the space industry. Uh, we have a spacecraft actually under construction. It's in its final week, so it will be leaving soon, uh, and it will be heading to the moon uh, it's flying to the moon early next year, uh, so we hope you get to stop down and see it. I'll be talking more about that spacecraft in a little bit. Uh, but our goal at Moonshot Museum, and, and my goal tonight, uh, is to talk about some of the inspirations uh, that are sending us from the Earth to the moon uh, and hope to inspire that next generation uh, that will carry the torch and take us to the moon, to Mars, and beyond. Um, some of the stories we love to tell include, of course, uh, science fiction writer Jules Verne, uh, who in 1865 published From the Earth to the Moon. Uh, he fancied a gigantic cannon uh, looking to places like Baltimore, looking to Pittsburgh, where massive foundries were uh, creating huge cast iron cannons uh, during the American Civil War. Uh, Jules Verne wanted to put those uh, to a different use for exploration and fire um, astronauts in a whimsical spaceship from a cannon to the moon. Uh, one of my favorite Verne quotes, uh, he said that anything you can imagine, you can make real. Uh, and his science fiction quite literally inspired the first rocket scientists. Uh, just a sampling of some of the stories that we tell about Pittsburghers past, present, and future. John Brashear was a mill worker first and a maker, and then became a moon gazer. Uh, so John Brashear was inspired 
Uh, as a boy, I love his source of inspiration, gazing at the moon uh, and Saturn nearby in conjunction through a telescope. Uh, and it was that moment uh, as a boy that inspired him to become a telescope maker. Uh, so he was a mill worker by day. Uh, and at night, he and his wife, Phoebe, uh, were tirelessly uh, polishing glass, making lenses, uh, literally um, in their garage, uh, and grew that business um, to become a world-renowned and respected telescope company. Uh, and today on the moon, actually at the moon's South Pole, uh, Brashear Crater honors John and Phoebe's achievement. One of the unsung heroes of the space race uh, from Pittsburgh is Elaine Arrington uh, from West Mifflin. As she says, there's magic in complex math uh, and she would know better than anyone. Uh, Dr. Arrington really does dream in numbers. And during the space race, uh, her job was to analyze Soviet aircraft and basically keep tabs on the competition. Uh, she became one of the first black women in the United States to earn a PhD in math. Uh, and was a University of Pittsburgh math professor, um, a professor at CCAC as well, where she helped countless students really calculate their own career trajectories. We all know there is a flag left by Apollo 11 on the moon, and it appears to fly, even though the moon is, of course, windless. It was a Pittsburgher who made that happen. Jack Kinsler from Mount Washington uh, was known as NASA's Mr. Fix-It, uh, and he was determined to make the American flag appear to fly, even though the moon was windless. Uh, so he got the idea actually by watching his mom hang curtains uh, as a child in Mount Washington. Uh, he fought back to that and he engineered an extending telescoping rod at the top of the flag uh, to make sure it appeared to stay in a fixed, fluttery, wavy position. Uh, Jack Kinsler also created the plaque for uh, the Apollo missions, uh, including Apollo 11. Perhaps my own personal hero is uh, NASA astronaut Mike Fink from Emsworth, uh, just a couple of miles uh, up the river from Moonshot Museum. Uh, space flight is the world's biggest team sport. Uh, Mike Fink has logged over a year in orbit, performed nine spacewalks, uh, and has been to the International Space Station three times, twice as the commander. Uh, he took his inspiration from trips as a child to the original Buell Planetarium and rocket clubs on the north side. Uh, I think interesting in his background is that in addition to uh, his STEM training and skills, he also felt that learning foreign languages was critical to his success as an astronaut. He's fluent in both Japanese and Russian um, and felt that was critical to giving him the edge as he moved through astronaut training. Uh, but even more importantly, uh, that that's uh, important to building community in the cosmos to build a, a multilingual society. Uh, and as Mike has said, I think it's important that we appreciate space, not just for the science and technology it gives us, but for its human value, for its power to capture our imaginations. And I think that encapsulates our journey into space. It's always been this dance between uh, the science that's taking us there and the science fiction media, the literature, the books, the writing uh, that inspires us. And then as new science is accomplished, uh, it launches a whole new um, a whole new sea change in what is written to inspire the next move forward. So with that in mind, that union of science and imagination, uh, I'd like to fire your imaginations tonight uh, on a journey to the moon. And we'll start with perhaps the most prominent feature in the night sky. If you're looking up at a full moon and you look to the lower left, you'll notice Tycho Crater. It's brighter than everything else uh, on the near side of the moon from our perspective. You can see it even without a telescope or without binoculars, you can notice that difference uh, in luminosity. It has chalky rays that are visible in our sky. And it's inspired science fiction writers uh, over the decades. In From the Earth to the Moon, Jules Verne uh, described the ray system of Tycho Crater in great detail. Robert Heinlein wrote a short story uh, in 1940 um, with a little bit of a different tack. Um, his short story is called Blow Ups Happen. <laughs> and in this, uh, Tycho's rays uh, are seen as the result of the aftermath of an atomic power plant uh, and an accident that went awry and wiped out an alien race. 
perhaps a little closer to our time, Tycho Crater featured as the site where the monolith was discovered in Arthur C. Clarke's classic 2001 A Space Odyssey. Uh, it's also featured in the movie Star Trek First Contact uh, and in The Expanse, uh, where Tycho is the name of a large-scale lunar construction corporation. Uh, easy to see why this prominent feature on the moon would inspire so many writers. I think what's most exciting about Tycho Crater, uh, in addition to those streaks, is the mountain you find in the center. This is Tycho Peak. It's at the very center of the crater, and it's over one mile tall, and it formed during an asteroid impact. We're going to fly there right now to Tycho Crater to take a closer look. So I invite you the next time you're outside and the moon is full to look at the streaks, what we call the rays, the bright white rays that form from that asteroid impact. But here with data from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, we can see the crater itself and that one mile tall mountain in the middle. It's nine miles wide, Tycho Peak, and it formed in just a matter of minutes. Here you can see it in stark relief uh, during a sunrise. Oftentimes, we're talking about things on a grand scale of cosmic time. Uh, but in this case, when an asteroid smashed into the moon, lots of debris shot outward, and then uh, there was a backflow. It surged to the center. It had nowhere to go when it met but up. Uh, and that mountain was actually formed in just a matter of minutes, completely reshaping the face of the moon. And the next stop on our tour is the Sea of Tranquility. Uh, so what I've highlighted here is the landing site where Apollo 11 touched down in 1969. The Sea of Tranquility is one of the dark patches we see on the moon uh, made of darker volcanic rock. Ancient people thought these were oceans or seas. We call them mare, the Latin for seas. And this is the Sea of Tranquility. It's the, the second of two patches on the right-hand side of the moon. Uh, and it is the subject of Andy Weir's book, Artemis. Uh, Andy Weir sets a science fiction heist story uh, in the moon's first city, the year is 2080. Uh, and we see familiar massive domes on the moon, as we might expect for a utopian society on the moon. Uh, those domes in the book are covered, they're made of aluminum, uh, which is quite realistic, actually. Aluminum is the most abundant metal on the moon. and they're covered in lunar regolith, in lunar soil. Uh, and that makes sense as well because that lunar soil uh, is a good insulation. Uh, it helps to protect people on the inside of the colony from days that could be hotter than boiling water uh, and nights that would be over 200 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. Uh, so that lunar regolith coating the domes uh, is very important to insulating and protecting the society. Uh, it's an interesting book, and it also includes a nearby visitor center. If you've ever wanted uh, what it might be like to be a park ranger on the moon in the future, interpreting the history of Apollo 11. Uh, and it's also near a mining facility. And that science fiction makes a lot of sense. It takes its cue from the real science of the moon. Uh, the spacecraft Galileo, en route to Jupiter in 1992, flew by the moon, uh, took a picture from the North Pole looking down, and this is a, a representational sort of mosaic of the different minerals that we see on the moon. Uh, lots of volcanic rocks in orange and green, uh, lots of pink, and that represents the abundance of aluminum across the lunar highlands, the brighter regions of the moon. Those are particularly rich in aluminum. Dark blue, and you'll see a dark blue patch kind of in the lower left of your screen. That indicates titanium, another very valuable metal. And it's particularly rich in the Sea of Tranquility where Apollo 11 landed. Uh, so it stands to reason that perhaps a future base might be built there to mine materials like titanium. As we look at commercial exploration on the moon, uh, it has a lot of opportunity. There's titanium for spacecraft construction, uh, silicon for semiconductors throughout the lunar soil. Uh, it's of course easier to build with what you have on the moon than it is to uh, use the fuel and the rocket equation to escape Earth's gravity and head to the moon. Uh, so the more we can build with those metals there, the more sustainable a society could be. Uh, but it also contains minerals that could be brought back to Earth, uh, perhaps platinum for pacemakers or other medical research. 
Uh, and there's an interesting argument to be made that we could harness useful elements uh, from the moon, which is of course lifeless, uh, instead of strip mining here on Earth. Um, and as we actually head to the moon, uh, we're going to see in the next couple of decades issues like this moving out of the realm of science fiction and into the realm of space law and policy as we figure out how are claims made uh, and honored on the moon, who owns the moon, and who has the right to uh, profit from these resources. Um, and or is the moon essentially a global commons, and how do we figure out how to equitably divide uh, the minerals that we might find there? All right, so coming back to Apollo 11 and the Sea of Tranquility, uh, where Buzz Aldrin saluted this first flag, of course, planted by a Pittsburgher, Jack Kinsler. Uh, let's use that now as a stepping off point, uh, because this mission didn't happen in a vacuum. It was part of a series of missions, uh, both getting us to the moon and then continuing through the late 1960s and early 70s uh, to explore uh, the equatorial regions of the moon. Just a few months before, Apollo 10 had orbited the moon, uh, came very close to landing, did not have enough gas in the tank to actually make a landing, uh, but did everything else in probably the most um, the most incredible dress rehearsal in history, really. Um, the lander flew within nine miles of the lunar surface. Um, I would have been tempted to land if I were an astronaut on board, uh, but they didn't quite have enough gas. Um, but they they tested everything else out and returned home in order to pave the way for Apollo 11. Uh, their command module was named Charlie Brown. Uh, the lunar lander was named uh, Snoopy. Actually, fun fact, uh, Charlie Brown and Snoopy are still mascots for NASA's Artemis program today uh, as we return to the moon. And then Apollo 11 was followed up by a series of scientific missions. Apollo 12 went to the Ocean of Storms. Uh, and you'll notice on my slides in the lower right hand side, I have the near side of the moon and you'll see some blue dots that will always be referencing uh, the geographic location I'm talking about. Uh, so you can see here the landing site of Apollo 12, uh, the ocean of storms, you'll see the next time the moon is full on the left hand side, it's the biggest dark blotch, the biggest volcanic patch on the moon. This was really a technical feat because this spacecraft landed uh, just a few hundred feet away from another one that had landed several years before. A 1967 robotic lander named Surveyor 3 uh, had landed uh, just a couple years before Apollo 12. So astronauts were able to actually walk from their landing module over to Surveyor. Uh, they brought pieces of the camera back home, and that's where the real surprise happened. Scientists found there were stowaways. There was Earth bacteria that had made its way to the moon uh, it had survived on the moon, uh, and then when it came back to Earth, life functions resumed again. Uh, so an interesting sort of science footnote, uh, but also speaks to why we need to be so diligent now in creating spacecraft and clean rooms uh, that we don't take any microbes from Earth with us to other worlds. Apollo 13, of course, um, failed to land, but it was a successful failure in many ways. Um, that oxygen tank explosion stopped the crew from landing, uh, but it was a huge success in that uh, they made it home safely. Uh, and that was partly due to uh, an African-American mathematician from West Virginia named Katherine Johnson, um, the central figure in, um, in the movie Hidden Figures. It was her backup procedures and star charts that really, in no small measure, allowed the crew of Apollo 13 to safely return home. Apollo 14 landed where Apollo 13 had planned to um, in a location known as Frau Morrow in 1971. Um, this mission is kind of fun because Alan Shepard, after collecting almost 100 pounds of rocks <laughs> um, and carting them back to, to the lander, spent a little time hitting golf balls, uh, making a, a hole in one in a nearby crater. And then Apollo 15 gave up Pittsburgher another chance to shine. Uh, in this case, Pittsburgh astronaut James Irwin, who made history by driving the first lunar rover. He's pictured here. Uh, he collected a four billion year old rock sample uh, known as the Genesis rock uh, because it dates back uh, to the birth of the moon, essentially. Uh, and it's a sample of a anorthosite. And that's a mineral uh, composed of uh, um, primarily aluminum that gives the lunar highlands their light gray color. Um, so the lunar highlands being the brighter regions that you see on, on the moon as opposed to the volcanic patches. 
Apollo 16 followed up a few months later with the Lunar Rover Grand Prix. Um, so if you're going to take a car to the moon, why not do some hairpin turns and stops? Um, they actually brought back some interesting science that overturned uh, what scientists had thought previously. They thought that volcanoes formed the lighter regions of the moon, um, and it turned out uh, that, that that was not the case, um, demonstrating the need to actually have boots on the ground and take samples there and bring them back for analysis, um, overturning what scientists had previously thought. And our final mission to the moon was in 1972, our final peopled mission. That was Apollo 17. And this might look like a, an image from the Martian or a picture of Mars, uh, but this orange soil is actually from the moon. Um, the crew found this uh, orange soil and uh, found glass inside um, from the explosive eruption of an ancient volcano from an event known as a fire fountain. Uh, and you can see a microscope image of the glass there. Now, I've been talking about volcanoes quite a bit, and I should emphasize, of course, these, these volcanoes have been dormant uh, for eons, uh, but they help shape the moon we see today. Uh, when we're looking up at the moon, essentially, we are reading an old book uh, that has been preserved for the ages with no wind uh, or water to, to erode it or change its face over time. And this was our last, um, our last instance of sending people to the moon until now. Uh, so the story picks up again now in 2022 with a robotic mission to a location known as Lacus Mortis. Uh, you'll see on your screen here, um, that circle shows a very faint outline of a crater. It was a huge crater impact. An ancient crater from over 3 billion years ago. That's the broader sort of uh, fuzzy outline you see there. It's almost 100 miles in diameter. Inside, there's a smaller crater, a little more pronounced. His name is Berg. Just in time for Pittsburgh to get there, right? Well, this crater is a little more preserved. It's younger. It's smaller. You can see some step-like terraces inside. We've got a couple of central peaks. Each of them raises over half a mile above the floor of the crater. And I'm using a software now called NASA Moon Trek, uh, which you can actually check out online as well. Um, to do these, these flights over the lunar terrain. We're going to move just west of Berg here. You'll see some very smooth plains. Lacus Mortis is known as the Lake of Death, and it's a very smooth area um, formed of volcanic rock. It has some massive fractures, these straight lines that you can see on your screen. We call those rills. They can be up to 100 meters deep. They can be um, a mile and a half across, uh, and they formed when magma rose up through the cracks in the moon's crust uh, to make valleys long ago. Here, we'll take another view here. And as the camera pans down, you can see in the lower left, the terrain gets a little rockier. This crater, Lacus Mortis, this sort of eroded uh, crater region here is, is just to the north of two dome-shaped volcanoes like shield volcanoes on Earth, uh, more round than tall. Each of these volcanoes is only about as tall as the Statue of Liberty, about 100 miles tall, uh, but a mile and a half across. This is where a Pittsburgh-based spacecraft is heading in just a few months. Uh, this is the Peregrine spacecraft. I've been watching it built uh, over the last few months here on the north side, uh, and it will achieve a lot of firsts as it makes history. This will be the first American spacecraft to land on the moon, to soft land, since Apollo 17 uh, back in 1972. It will be the first commercial lunar lander, uh, so it's a whole new way of doing space exploration, uh, and it will carry payloads from countries around the world. So many other nations are getting their Apollo movement sending scientific instruments to study the lunar landscape. Uh, it has 11 different sensors from NASA uh, to study um, radiation on the moon. There are infrared sensors to look for ice. Um, there are thermal sensors looking for carbon dioxide and methane deposits, um, all useful resources we could use for, for rocket fuel generation. Uh, and there are commemorative items and advertisements on there as well. Uh, there's a Japanese soft drink company um, sending up a product called Picari Sweat. It's a uh, it's a, um, a powder drink, uh, something like Gatorade, and the powder is, is going to the moon. <laughs> uh, so there are a number of mementos, um, commemoratives 
um, but primarily science from around the world that's being carried to Lacus Mortis. Uh, the spacecraft is named Peregrine for the Peregrine Falcon. Uh, it's the world's fastest animal, uh, and it's truly an international bird found on every continent except Antarctica. Uh, so it made sense for this international mission. Uh, here's a photo I snapped just a couple days ago in the clean room of Peregrine under construction. As I said, NASA is including a neutron spectrometer to look for ice, um, an infrared spectrometer to look for carbon dioxide and methane. Uh, there's even going to be a laser reflector bouncing laser beams between the Earth and the moon to measure the distance. Uh, the payload here is, uh, the payloads are all full. Uh, and it will be going up in just a few months. There's a rover attached to this lander as well. It's about the size of a microwave. I'll get back to that in a moment. Uh, this is the mission patch. Uh, really kind of harkens back, I think, to the Apollo era while also showing our, our future on the moon. We have the Peregrine Falcon. Uh, it's heading to the moon. Uh, it has um, seven craters for the seven major countries that are involved. Uh, and the phase of the moon, uh, which we call waxing gibbous, it's just a little more than uh, than the quarter moon there, uh, that will be the phase of the moon when Peregrine touches down. So a lot of symbolism baked into this patch. All right, back to the clean room for a moment. Uh, you can see um, everyone here walking around in bunny suits and hairnets, um, trying to make sure that they don't uh, get any dust or debris on any of the delicate sensors, uh, since they can't fix that in space or clean them off. <laughs> um, they even have wires as they're walking around in the clean room that they periodically touch to ground to make sure there's no static electric buildup as well. And the gentleman in the center there is working on a small rover about the size of a microwave. That rover is named Iris. Uh, this was built by students at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, so when Peregrine gets to the lava plain, to Lacus Mortis, uh, it will deposit Iris, uh, which will go off on an adventure looking for skylights. These are holes in the ground, and it's going to look into those holes and see what's down there. Um, hopefully, it will find some underground caves. We already have data from orbit uh, that the moon has colossal caverns underground that could easily swallow a city the size of Pittsburgh, um, and we're looking to map those out. Uh, those could be great sites for future human settlers, actually, to live on the moon, protected from the extremes of uh, the temperature swings on the lunar surface. It's about a four-pound rover. Again, built by students at CMU. Uh, here you can see it uh, just off to the left, attached to Peregrine. All right, this entire payload is going to launch on a 200 foot tall rocket called the Vulcan Centaur. It has solid rocket boosters. Uh, it's made by the United Launch Alliance, ULA, um, which has a, a rich history in the business of sending robots to space. Um, this is a new experimental craft for them, a two stage rocket. Uh, the bottom stage is Vulcan, it's methane fuel and oxygen. The top stage is uh, Centaur, it's hydrogen fuel and liquid oxygen. Uh, and that will get Peregrine to space. Now, that will happen at Cape Canaveral in Florida, uh, but the minute it leaves Earth's atmosphere, Mission Control Pittsburgh will take over. So again, from on the north side, uh, Peregrine's navigation and science operations on the moon will be coordinated. We're looking at here a, a simulation of Peregrine on its journey. Now, the Vulcan Centaur is powerful, but it's not quite as powerful as a Saturn V, which just pushed uh, Neil Armstrong and company directly to the moon in three days. Uh, this is going to be a trip that takes uh, a few weeks, actually. Uh, so it's a different kind of trajectory, um, looping the Earth multiple times in wider and wider ellipses. Eventually, the moon catches up with Peregrine's path. Uh, and then it again orbits the moon in successively small, tighter orbits uh, until it lands uh, a few weeks after it's actually launched from Earth. This is a render that a space artist did of what Peregrine will look like when it lands. Uh, and again, mission control right here in Pittsburgh will be, will be overseeing the mission. Uh, so it's an exciting time to be looking for uh, um, 
caves on the moon. We're joined by some data from orbit. This is the Kaguya or Kaguya orbiter uh, from Japan. Uh, and in 2007, it found one of these skylights, one of these holes in the grounds descending to ancient caverns. Uh, so it first discovered one in 2007. That spacecraft, by the way, is named for a Japanese moon princess, Kaguya. Uh, and I mention that because uh, this is a science fiction story that is uh, easily a millennium uh, old. Um, princess Kaguya was sent from the moon to Japan, raised by human parents who discovered her in a glowing bamboo stock, uh, and then she returned to, to the moon. Uh, so arguably, she's one of our oldest science fiction heroes, uh, and it makes sense that, uh, that that spacecraft was named in her honor. That skylight that that Japanese spacecraft discovered was imaged uh, earlier this year by NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. This skylight is called the Marius Hills Pit, um, it's exciting because it might lead to a cave, but it's also exciting because uh, for the moon, it's pretty comfortable. Uh, it's not boiling hot during the day. It's not cryogenic cold. It's about 63 degrees Fahrenheit day and night. Uh, so when we think about settling the moon, uh, we began as cave people on Earth, uh, and it's likely that we may be cave dwellers at first on the moon. Settling inside colossal caves with huge inflatable habitats um, enclosed and protected. Now, while Peregrine will be launching to the moon uh, early next year, I hope uh, you'll be able to come down to Moonshot Museum and see its uh, final uh, legs of construction over the next couple of weeks. Uh, but there is another Pittsburgh spaceship already planned, and that will be heading to the moon's south pole. So we're going to fly now to the very geographic south pole of the moon. Again, using NASA data, we just visualized um, likely ice deposits that were imaged by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. That's an elevation map there where you can see Shackleton Crater, which is always in darkness, except for the crater rim, which is often in sunlight. Shackleton Crater uh, never sees sunlight at the bowl of that crater, so any ice that would have been deposited by an ancient comet has been frozen there and has never been um, disturbed by sunlight. Uh, so we're heading back to the south pole of the moon to find ice because that's the likeliest spot, some of the coldest spots in the solar system there. And future astronauts on the south pole might see a view like this. The sun is always low on the horizon, just like it as it would be in Antarctica. Uh, the Earth is always uh, bobbing up and down, fairly low on the horizon. And you might notice uh, it appears to be rotating backwards and upside down uh, because you're on the South Pole. India first discovered water uh, in the moon's polar regions with an onboard NASA sensor um, and even in um, with an orbiter called Chandrayaan, uh, which means moon vehicle in Sanskrit, uh, and a probe, which was uh, basically detached and crashed intentionally into Shackleton Crater uh, to confirm the presence of ice. NASA did the same thing in 2009. It sent a spacecraft called Elcross uh, to a nearby South Pole crater named Cabeus Crater. Uh, it smashed into that crater, released water ice crystals, also confirm some useful metals uh, that could be mined at the South Pole. Mercury, magnesium, silver, all kinds of interesting stuff there. And here's Shackleton Crater uh, in a different light. This is a 3D map. Uh, so you can see the red is the crater rim. That blue is the depth of the crater there. Not only is it interesting because of the ice that we can find at the bottom, uh, ice that we could use to make water, um, to break apart with electricity. And then we've got hydrogen and oxygen, both great ingredients for rocket fuel. Uh, but we have those crater rims, which are often in sunlight. So it's a great place for solar power installations as well. Here's a view of the South Pole um, that a space artist colored using ultraviolet imaging. Uh, LRO has been using ultraviolet sensors, infrared sensors, 
um, to help make sense of that South Pole where visible data really doesn't allow us to see what's happening because those craters are always shadowed. So we have over a decade now of great data, um, thanks to LRO. The next thing is to confirm it on the ground. Uh, and that is where Pittsburgh's coming in. Uh, this will be the next spacecraft built here on the north side. It's known as Griffin. Uh, it will be about the size of a car, and it will land a NASA rover known as Viper. Looks like a golf cart. Uh, and that will land on the South Pole in 2024. Uh, you can see the solar panels are actually vertical there to capture that sun low on the horizon at the South Pole. They're heading to another crater nearby. Uh, because it's South Pole on the moon, we have lots of... Uh, Lots of polar adventures for crater names, Shackleton Crater, uh, Nobile Crater for Italian Arctic explorer Umberto Nobile. Uh, so Astrobotic is building the Griffin lander, which will deliver Viper to the South Pole. Uh, and we're going to take a sneak peek at that. So you can see Tycho Crater again, which you can see the next time the moon is full. Uh, but let's zoom in on Shackleton, and we'll get a sneak peek at uh, the route that this rover will take. You can see the crater rim of Shackleton is right in the crosshairs there uh, for the geographic south pole of the moon. I'm going to move us just slightly. Here are many landing sites that NASA is considering for future human explorers on the moon. Uh, and in order to confirm the VEST landing site, uh, the Griffin lander and the Viper robot will help to find where the ice is because we want to land where that ice is. Uh, so let's zoom in on Nobile Crater. For a closer look, you can see the, those long shadows moving on the ground from the sun. And here's a, um, a general idea of the route that the Viper Robo will take. So when the Griffin Lander built in Pittsburgh gets there, it will deploy its ramps. Viper will wheel off the the best ramp, it will be a game day decision, uh, and it will basically traverse the rims of different craters uh, using sensors to look into the depths of those craters, into those bowls, uh, to confirm exactly where the ice is. Uh, and this is its route, and that whole route was optimized uh, to make sure that there's sunlight, um, to keep it powered, uh, to make sure it's uh, pretty well thermal regulated, uh, and that the terrain would be would be safe for Viper to traverse. Uh, and here's just an image of Viper uh, kind of undocking from Griffin and heading off on its ice quest. So this mission uh, with this lander built in Pittsburgh is really going to be the tip of the spear of the Artemis program. Artemis in Greek mythology being the, the twin sister of Apollo and goddess of the moon. Uh, and the Artemis program will in the next few years, take the first woman to the moon, the first person of color to the moon, and really establish a permanent presence. We're waiting for Artemis 1 to do um, an uncrewed test launch, but here's what's coming next to look forward to. Artemis 2 in 2024 will fly around the moon. It will carry the first American crew as well as the first Canadian, um, the first Canadian to orbit the moon and the first Americans in 50 years. And then Artemis III uh, plans to land at the South Pole using the data we've collected uh, on a SpaceX Starship lander. And again, Pittsburgh will be playing a role here. Uh, these are cube rovers. These are um, small spacecraft about the size of a toaster. Uh, they're built here, and uh, they are designed so that they can ride that razor-sharp moon dust, what we call regolith. Uh, that they have wheels that are very sturdy for traction and turning. Uh, and in the future, um, these cube rovers will be designed to basically endure the cold of lunar night. Uh, right now, that's not something that we can do, but that's an exciting innovation for the future. That's what's coming next, is waking up these cube rovers after two weeks of night and cold and letting them reactivate. Um, so they can basically deploy science cargo uh, anywhere on the lunar surface. In terms of creating a, a permanent human settlement, uh, cube rovers will actually be deploying mobile solar arrays. So again, they're vertical because the sun is low to the horizon at the South Pole. Um, but those cube rovers 
on wheels will be able to deploy a mobile power grid uh, to help generate electricity wherever we need it uh, at the South Pole. And here's just a shot of a cube rover in the lab being tested on that regolith. A key feature of the Artemis program is really going back to the moon to stay, to build a permanent human presence. Uh, so while we'd be building a Luna grid to harness the power of the sun permanently on the moon, there would also be a lunar gateway space station, kind of like an international space station, but orbiting the moon, always occupied by astronauts. Um, so we'd always have a crew on board and then another crew traveling uh, to and from the lunar surface to conduct science. And where do we go from there? What does the future hold? I think it's pretty exciting. This is Moon Village. Uh, this is the European Space Agency's proposal for inflatable pressurized pods. They would have to withstand all the temperature extremes, solar radiation, um, the harshness of moon dust. Uh, but this is what uh, that architecture could look like. One, one artist's vision for that. Here we see greenhouses will be important. Uh, whether they are actually on the surface of the moon or perhaps more likely underground uh, or not in glass as depicted here, although that certainly looks, um, uh, looks compelling. Um, we wouldn't be harnessing sunlight directly. Uh, we would have plants grown inside habitats. Uh, this is happening on the International Space Station right now. Uh, and we look to see that happening on the moon in the future. So growing plants hydroponically, uh, using artificial sunshine from red and blue light, uh, the two wavelengths, we really need to jumpstart photosynthesis. Uh, so they're bathed in red and blue light, um, essentially in artificial um, solutions without soil uh, in order to grow. Uh, this is something that uh, has already been done successfully on the ISS, uh, growing lettuce. Um, in 2014, astronauts grew a, a red romaine lettuce that they dubbed outrageous. Um, that's been the most abundant low Earth orbit crop so far. Perhaps uh, potatoes like in the Martian will be coming <laughs> in the future. Uh, and here's just a sneak peek at what living on the moon might look like. Uh, so again, we'd want to build with what's there, and that includes domed habitats. Uh, that lunar regolith can be nasty. It can be razor sharp. Uh, it can be a threat to breathe, but it's also a great insulator. So we might cover our homes uh, in lunar regolith on the moon. That'd be more efficient than transporting from Earth. And not only could it be a good insulation, but it could be good for building. Right now on the International Space Station, uh, there are projects to test 3D printing artificial lunar soil. In the future, we might actually live off the land and 3D print um, entire bricks out of lunar soil to build habitats. And here we see one vision for that, sort of these three-story pineapple structures made of repeating lunar bricks. NASA already has an analog on Earth called HERA. That's the Human Exploration Research Analog, where, um, where trainees are sealed into habitats like this for long-term work. And they have a, a living and a work and a hygiene model a module and a simulated airlock. But kind of exciting to think that we can build with what's there on the land. All right, we have time for just a couple more stops today before we get to questions. So I'd like to take us now to the far side of the moon. Uh, you'll notice that looks a lot different than the near side. We don't have all of those dark volcanic patches. I'm going to show you here an animation of when the moon was young and molten. When our solar system was young, uh, we had a bombardment of space rocks hitting the moon, potmarking it, creating the, the craters that we see today. A majority of those hit the far side of the moon. So that side is actually more heavily cratered. We can see those rocks coming in and forming craters. Now that activity, especially on the far side, actually triggered uh, seismic events underground. And on the near side of the moon, which is thinner in crust, it triggered volcanic eruptions. So it was those impacts on the far side of the moon that triggered volcanic activity on the near side, which cooled into the mare or seas and oceans that we see today. 
Now, even the far side is exciting in terms of future exploration uh, because we're turned away from the radio noise of civilization. So astronomers are excited about taking uh, a crater and turning it into a natural radio dish uh, to basically listen to signals, detect radio waves from the early universe. So lots of possibilities uh, as we look to the moon and science fiction uh, in this era when science fiction is rapidly turning into real science and the, the future is, uh, is happening. Uh, but I thought I'd close with just a couple of quotes before we go to questions here. One is perhaps the most important image that we got from the moon. And uh, as astronaut Bill Anders argued, we came all the way to the moon to discover the Earth. Uh, this is the Earthrise photo taken by Apollo 8, of course, in 1968, and it's credited with spawning the worldwide environmental movement. And I think it's important to, to consider that as we're looking at innovations to get to the moon or to get to Mars, uh, that it's data from space that, uh, while managed, helps us be stewards of our home planet, that it's innovations in microgravity uh, that we can uh, apply to help solve um, technological challenges here on Earth. Um, and as we look to the moon and Mars, at the same time, we're looking at what kind of future we're building here on our planet. Perhaps my favorite photo from space is uh, the Earth and the far side of the moon together, taken from one million miles away by the Deep Space Climate Observatory in 2015. Uh, we are moving from a one world species to a two world species in our lifetime. We will have people permanently residing on the moon. Uh, so it's an exciting opportunity, but I also think it shows the stark contrast between the Earth and the Moon, um, and that as we're reaching out into space, what we can learn there um, from that unique orbital perspective can help us be stewards uh, of our oasis of life. So I'm uh, uh, excited to take some questions. Hope you enjoyed our talk, and I'll just leave you with a thought from Andy Weir, uh, that a story in your head isn't just a story. Uh, it's just a daydream until you actually write it down. Uh, so if you've been inspired by uh, any of the science happening right now uh, that's taking us to the moon uh, and to Mars, um, if you're avid readers or writers, I encourage you to write those stories down um, and create future science fiction because you never know uh, what budding scientists you're writing uh, could inspire next. Thank, Thank you very so much. much. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, we did have some questions and we still have time if people want to put some more questions in chat. Um, the first question we got, um, so you talked about different mementos from different nations going to the moon. Um, is there a Pittsburgh, like a terrible tower or any or towel or anything Pittsburgh, you know, focused going? Uh, yes. So a two, that's a great question. So a two part uh, question. Um, the terrible towel has been to the International Space Station. If you haven't seen that, I encourage you to Google that. Um, astronaut Mike Fink has taken that into orbit. Um, on board uh, the Peregrine lander and future astrobotic landers, you can actually um, create your own message to the moon. Um, so you can actually do that online or you can come to the museum um, and write or draw your own message. Um, those will be scanned and then sent on a future astrobotic lander to the surface of the moon. That's great. Thank you. Uh, we had a question from Jennifer. Uh, she wants to know if visitors are allowed to view the clean room while at the museum. Yes, absolutely. Um, so anytime you come to the museum, um, you can uh, get just a look through the window at the real-time work of what's happening right there. We we literally share a wall with the clean room, uh, an entire glass wall. Uh, so uh, you'll always be able to see whatever is happening that day. Great. Uh, let's see. Uh, we had a question from Rick. He wanted to know what software did you use for like the pictures of the moon, the renders, the videos? Sure. Um, so a software that I used primarily uh, was NASA Moon Trek. Um, and I highly recommend checking that out um, because that's that's just something fun that you can um, can find and manipulate online. Um, I also uh, downloaded a number of uh, videos NASA's Scientific Visualization Studio um, at the Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, so if you would just Google NASA SVS, um, you can see a lot of really interesting moon. I will just, I'm going to type in the chat here um, just a couple things to check out. Uh, one is NASA's Scientific Visualization Studio um, okay. to take a look at animations, and the other is NASA Moon Trek. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we did have some questions about the museum. Um, we wanted people want to know 
like what the general hours are, um, what it costs, like what kind of exhibits would they see? Sure. Um, so we are open to the public um, Wednesdays through Sundays currently, uh, 10 to 4. Um, and I would plan about an hour for your trip. Um, we have uh, a documentary uh, that really highlights Pittsburgh and this moment in space. Uh, we have the view into the clean room. Uh, and then we have a number of zones you can explore. So you can actually design your own rover um, and try to get them to work um, and see if they can meet the challenge of finding ice on the moon. Um, you can visit the lunar South Pole. We have a whole sort of immersive landscape of the South Pole. Um, and you can trace both past, present, and future missions on the moon. Um, you can create your own mission patch and scan it, and it becomes projected onto the wall and learn a little bit about um, space art um, and the role of artists in inspiring the space industry. Um, we have a scavenger hunt where you can learn about different careers and explore our cargo bay um, and just sort of learn about the, the diversity of things happening earth orbit and getting to the moon uh, and we have a, a lunar habitat you can explore um, and one of my favorite areas called space debates uh, where you get to sit down and be in charge of the moon <laughs> uh, and create the rules uh, uh, and decide for yourself how you want it to work so um, it's highly interactive and we have I think a nice uh, fun mix of science engineering social studies art uh, and uh, careers to explore that sounds wonderful I need to go as soon as possible come yeah come on down so <laughs> Uh, we have a few other questions. Um, could someone ask um, if Astrobotics ever made or worked with SpaceX? Um, yes, actually. So while ULA is a our um, ride to the moon for the Peregrine Lander, um, Astrobotics uh, Griffin Lander and NASA's Viper rover will be going up on a SpaceX vehicle in 2024. Okay. Um, and a follow-up question with that, they want to know if you have anything going up on Artemis. Um, so not on the Artemis one launch that I'm aware of, but we're deeply involved in the Artemis program overall. Um, Astrobotic works closely with NASA as part of um, what's known as the CLIPS program. It's the Commercial Lunar Payload Services program, uh, where NASA is um, working with Astrobotic uh, as a private company um, on the Griffin project um, and other projects. So sort of all of those pieces of building the robotic explorers and infrastructure for Artemis. Okay, thank you. Um, wait, another question, um, they wanna know what other nations, I think you said it was seven total are represented on the trip. Yes, there are seven in the mission patch, and I think there's actually that total has has increased <laughs> as well. Um, so there, there are quite a few nations actually, there are payloads um, from Mexico, um, Germany, the Netherlands, Nepal, Canada, uh, Hungary, um, Japan. So it, it literally is a global effort. Okay, thank you. Um, we had another question. Um, they wanna know why is aluminum so abundant on the moon? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So there's an awful lot of aluminum tied up um, in the north site on the lunar highlands. Um, and there is one theory that the, the moon essentially, and the Earth formed out of a cosmic collision during the early days of the solar system, uh, that the young Earth was hit by another protoplanet uh, known as Theia. Um, and when, when, when they crashed together, you had the present day Earth and Moon. So it stands uh, to reason that we see a lot of the same, the same elements on the Moon as, as we do on Earth. Okay. Uh, and, and aluminum, just as it is the most abundant metal in Earth's crust, uh, uh, seems to be the most abundant on the Moon as well. Okay. Cool. Um, we did have a question about the museum again. Um, they are curious why Pittsburgh uh, was chosen and how many people uh, currently work there. Oh, sure. Um, uh, so Pittsburgh, I think, was, you know, for many reasons chosen for its expertise in robotics. Um, and uh, Astrobotic itself, um, really the, the genesis of that came from Carnegie Mellon University. It's a graduate there who founded the company. Um, so it was really that expertise in robotics that, um, put them in a great position to, to be chosen as a, as a competitor. Um, and then in terms of, um, uh, approximate size, um, somewhere between 180 and 200 people work for Astrobotic. Um, I should mention too, with that Moonshot Museum, um, so I actually don't work for Astrobotic, though I get to interpret their, um, their engineering, which is a lot of fun. Um, we are a small nonprofit. 
um, that gets to share their campus. Um, but we have our own board and we just work um, entirely independently, other than having the benefit of, I think, the view into the spacecraft um, and having Astrobot volunteers who um, will walk the gallery and talk to visitors about their work and, and so on. Okay, great. I think we have time for one more question. Um, Lucy wanted to know if the moon has a magnetic field. Um, if not, why? Uh, so that's a great question. The moon actually does not have a magnetic field today. Um, and the thought is uh, that it was probably too small um, to have ever really produced um, the convection force to have a continuously strong magnetic field. Um, it was just too small to, to have that going. Um, in terms of the poles, um, I see your question in the chat there. That's, those are great questions. So those aren't magnetic poles, but they are geographic poles um, that are, are there for, for convenience in, in uh, planning missions to the moon. Okay. And real quick, we had a couple uh, asking um, what rocket is uh, Griffin on? Oh, Griffin is going to be going up on a SpaceX Falcon Heavy next oh. year. All right. Or 2024, I'm sorry. Yeah. Something to look forward to. All right. So I think we are basically at our time here. Uh, thank you so much, Mike, for joining us and doing this presentation for us. Congratulations on the brand new museum. I hope everyone gets a chance to visit real soon. Um, I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you so much for joining us. And I hope you can join us uh, next week for Andy Weir's novel November. All right, take care. And thanks again. Bye-bye. Thanks.